Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this mini lecture is called Reading and Writing, uh, Two Sides of the Same Coin. And really what today uh, I want to focus on is um, some of the aspects of the reading process that inform who we are and how we develop as writers and, and how some of our preconceived notions about reading um, can spill over into our writing and can affect us as writers. And so um, I first kind of developed this, this mindset because so many people, so many students would come to me over the course of a class and uh, talk about struggling with the writing process. And when we really drilled down, um, what, what I found was that more often than not, it wasn't about writing. It wasn't that the students or individuals didn't have anything that they wanted to say or express in writing. It was more that there was a breakdown in the way that they understood the reading and understood their relationship with the reading. And so if you're watching this, you've already uh, watched the clip on um, Shabo College uh, out of California, the reading between the lives. And at one point in there, um, there's a gentleman who, who shares how he gets through reading. And he says, well, you know, when I'm reading, I just try to get through it. I just try to do it. Um, he said that sometimes I'll just put on music and, you know, I'll just read to the beat. And that moment, right, where, where he talks about reading to the beat is fundamental to understanding the breakdown between reading and writing. If you're uh, reading to the beat, right, then what you're doing is you're getting through read, you're rehearsing the words um, of the reading. But there's not a lot of attention to what those words mean and how they impact you and how you interact with them. And so I want to spend uh, a few minutes here talking a little bit about what that process looks like and when we talk about reading, really what's involved. Um, once we start learning about writing, and what we're going to drill down, we're going to start talking about paragraphs and we're going to start talking about thesis statements, right? So if you know in writing where you put things, when you begin to think about things critically as a reader, you know where key points live. You know, for instance, an easy example of this is um, if you're reading, you know that if you read the first paragraph and then the first line of each subsequent paragraph, what you'll get is you'll get the thesis of the essay and you'll get a topic overview. Right? Like the first sentence of every paragraph in a well-constructed academic piece or a well-constructed um, published piece is almost always going to be your topic. And so knowing things like that you know, it changes the way you interact with texts and it changes the way you write and create texts for other people. So um, that's enough of in the way of uh, preview. Here is kind of the overview. So pardon my, all right. So this take on the writing process is called integrating reading and writing. And um, it just kind of guides our understanding of the process as a whole, right? Because our inability to read academic texts and, and in the activity um, that you did last week where you did the metacognitive awareness, you read the uh, who are you and what are you doing here text, and then you talked about how you read, right, each paragraph. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll get to that point and we'll stop. We'll get to a point where we begin fading or we're like, oh, this, this is boring or this doesn't make any sense or this doesn't apply to me and we just stop. And that point where we stop is the point where people begin to struggle writing academic papers, academic texts, because there's nothing to write about. You've, you've taken yourself, you've effectively taken yourself out of the conversation. An easy way to understand this, like um, my brother-in-law likes to watch rugby. Right. And so he'll talk to me about rugby, but, you know, I, I can really only listen so much because I don't have a strong understanding of of rugby as a sport. Right. Like I know it's kind of like football. I know it's kind of like soccer. I know some rudimentary principles, but I don't know any of the key players. I don't know really how plays are made. I don't know a lot around like the rules. I don't know about the history. I, I don't know any of that stuff. And so I can't engage with him. So a lot of it, like I don't have much to say, like if I had to, to 
have a start a conversation about rugby, I, I, I would struggle. In the same way, if you're not engaging in a text that a class is based on or that you're asked to write on, you're not going to have much in the tank in terms of um, your ability to create engaging, um, developed academic writing. And so because of this, that point where you stop off, that point where you get bored and you stop off, limits all kinds of opportunities for students. Um, limited literacy drives attrition, so, so leaving a class. It drives disengagement, thinking that the class isn't for you. And the reality is that if we're not engaging in the reading material in college, everything gets harder. And the reason we're in college, right, to, to provide greater economic mobility, to provide more opportunities, um, job attainment, right, all these things become much harder. And, and I firmly believe that much of this is a result of uh, um, failure to read well, right, or read thoroughly. And I don't think it has anything to do with ability. I think a lot of ways, a lot of things that, that create this scenario are built before we were ever really conscious of it. Because one of the things that education, and I've said this in other video segments, um, one of the things education is really good at is creating this perception of insiders and outsiders. And so, you know, if you imagine back when you were in elementary school, right, um, you were probably classified at that point as either a strong reader or as a weak reader based on um, your developmental stage. You know, and, and I mentioned this in a previous video, but those identities, those labels stick. And if we feel like an outsider, we tend to do things to preserve our dignity. We tend to do things to pre preserve our identity um, because it's not a comfortable space to be. And, and frankly, it, it's, it's unethical as educators for us, um, for, for instructors to put students in that position to label them so early. Because learning presupposes this social component. And if you feel like you're outside of the process, right, if you feel like reading was something for that other people were good at and you weren't, it distances you from, from all of this. And so um, we need reading to be this, this intensely social uh, component, right? And really what we're doing when we're reading a book is we're engaging with that author, right, intellectually, and with all of the other people who have read and uh, commented on it. And so you could pause this um, and, and think for a few moments about your own history as a reader. Right? So what supported your literacy development? What barriers did you face at various stages in your life um, as a reader? Right? Like, like was it popcorn reading that was bad for you? Or was it something, um, you know, did you stumble over words or did you have trouble with uh, pronunciation or um, attention, right? Like, I, you know, a lot of people struggle, uh, myself included, with um, attention deficit disorder. Um, you know, reading is different for those people. And there are certainly ways to get around it and ways to process, but, you know, it, it's, it's something that drives a wedge between you and the content. So a couple of things to think about as we're incorporating reading into the writing process is that we want to create a safe process. A safe space, excuse me, a safe space for yourself as a reader that it's okay. And I want to repeat this it is okay if you read something and don't understand it. Much of the stuff that we read, if it's worth reading, it is going to be expanding our, our repertoire. It's going to be expanding what we know and what we're aware of. You can't do that without gaps in understanding. So it's okay that you're not understanding something. It's okay to look words up. It's okay to listen to the audio version of a text instead of reading the print version. It's okay to use a screen reader. I think these are all tools that are at our disposal and I'm, I'm happy to share some of those if, if people are interested to shoot me an email. Um, you know, there's a relationship between literacy and power. If you can read well and if you can, if you can reflect on what you read effectively, you have more agency. You can represent yourself better. Um, and, the, and discussing these processes, discussing the problems, discussing solutions to these processes make us all better students. And it destigmatizes. Like we don't need to understand everything we read. 
We don't need to think everything we read is good. We don't need to think that the author has good intentions or is an expert. I think in having those conversations is, is an effective way to bring ourselves into the conversation. And in fact, those kinds of issues, when you say that the author isn't being as clear as he should be, or when you say the author isn't being as um, maybe as sensitive to his audience, or maybe he's tone deaf or biased, those are the kinds of things that we base our writing on. And so the fact that you feel that way when you're reading, right? And hopefully you felt a little bit of that when you were reading Mark Edmondson um, in the last module. You know, as you're reading him, you, you might be thinking like, wow, uh, this guy is very privileged. Or maybe this person is speaking to a segment of students that that is not me. Or maybe you're thinking like, God, I can't listen to Mark Edmondson talk about his father anymore. <laughs> right? Like you might be listening, hearing those things in that text. Or conversely, maybe it rang very true for you and you thought it was effective and you it, it, it resonated with you deeply. I'm very I'm positive that both of those things happened with folks who were reading the text last week. And it could have happened at different points for the same student. But you can feel differently about a text at different points in that text. Now we develop a personal component of our reading and it's important to be aware of our habits and our own relationship and this is something that shifts over the course of your life um, i know after i finished college there was a long period of time and this is embarrassing to admit because i'm a, I'm a writing instructor and I, I read a lot there was a period of, of a few years where i didn't read much um, i was really burnt out after i finished college i read a lot i was working a full-time job while i was attending college um, you know and, and I just didn't have it in me. So I was in this weird space where I was uh, teaching uh, about reading <laughs> um, and, and not reading myself much uh, beyond the, the content. Um, you know, so understanding your reader, your identity as a reader, what you like, what you don't like, what works for you as a reader, how frequently you need to take a break, what kind of content you're interested in, if you like nonfiction, if you like fiction, how to justify those likes and dislikes and if you're forced to read something outside of your comfort zone how to develop stamina like how do you read for a long time um developing reader confidence and range so being able to read a wide variety of texts and uh texts at a variety of difficulty levels so Understanding, you know, the factors that influence your thinking, understanding how you apply skills, understanding when you need strategies or what your um, what your profile is as a reader helps you to get to the point where you get to drafting. Right? That that's the goal of the reading process. The goal of the reading process is to eventually land in a space where you have an opinion to share. So some of these uh, some of these strategies, right, might might be to look at big picture. If you're a big picture thinker, to draw global conclusions at the end of a chapter. What were the major ideas that this that this author is trying to espouse? Or, you know, on the flip side, what specific ideas were mentioned and how do those map to your experiences? But reading is always about you, right? So it's always about you as a learner and you as an individual. You're thinking about how does this map? Does this force me to change my beliefs? Is this in line with my beliefs? Is this, does this run counter to my beliefs and my core values? You know, what, once you establish those kinds of things, and once you begin thinking along those terms, really a lot of reading is self-reflection. If you really, really strongly dislike something in, in a text, it's probably a signal that it's in conflict with some of your values or outside of your lived experiences. And then you have to make a choice. Do these Are these values something that makes sense? Is it worth you shifting your values? If it's outside of your lived experiences, is it invalidating your experiences or is it just aside from your experiences? So all of these things become really important questions that come up as you experience texts. Because as I said, and this is the two sides of the same coin here, if you've made it this far, um, I hope you have. Uh, 
reading and writing are, are inverse operations. You need writers to have readers and writers can't write unless they have an audience. And so as you're reading and as you're preparing to write, you're fulfilling your duty as a reader as you write. And you're also providing a new text for other people to read. And so they're mutually dependent, they're kind of codependent um, symbiotic processes and inverse operations. They're two sides of the same coin. Strong readers tend to have a more intimate understanding of things like focus, so your thesis statement, your development, right? The way that you propel that thesis statement forward with supporting evidence, your organization, your sentence-based organization, all of these things begin to solidify, become more clear um, the more you read. And so really there's reading is a key component of each of these processes, right? So reading is pre-writing, you should emphasize reading as a fundal part of the, of the composition process, right? So I always emphasize this to my students. So why is, uh, why is this text in existence and what's my response to it? It's kind of what I was just saying. Um, how can you enter into a conversation with this text? And then as you think about the drafting process, once you create a thesis and now you're building, think about the kinds of things that work for you when you read. Think about the ways that readings, the way that they're structured um, and how that structure lends itself to your understanding or not. And then reading as revision, thinking about what you put down on paper or thinking about what your peers put down on paper as a way to access um, some larger context. Um, as we're moving towards the end, and I'll stop sharing here. As we're moving towards the end of this next module, um, module four, we're going to be kind of culminating in this reflection of who we are as readers, but also very intentionally thinking about um, who we are as writers as well, and and our identity of, as writers, and thinking about what what we have to say about some of the texts and some of the experiences we've had. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing about you know your identity as a reader, that profile that you have, and I want you to think about maybe some of the ways that that has proven to be either helpful in your success as a student, uh, if it's previously been a barrier to you as a student. So I just want you to kind of consider the ways that this identity, your identity as a reader, has um, impacted your education thus far, and then reflect on where you're going. Um, as always, if you have questions or you want to chat about this, um, you're more than welcome to reach out over email. A couple of people have. Um, in the last week. You're also more than welcome to come and visit me here in person. I'm in the Learning Center in Gordon 202. Um, so if you're familiar with campus, if you go to the Starbucks and take a left and go through the cafeteria, um, when you go out the back doors of the cafeteria, we're uh, right through those doors. So you'll see our color changing sign. We're all enclosed in glass. Um, and so uh, I hope I hope some people um, visit in person if you're around. Thank you so much and uh, I'll see you online.